the uh, chairperson, uh, the chairperson is uh, will be Tanzit uh, Alam, and he is the uh, managing director of the Earth Matters uh, Consulting. I really like the name. <laughs> the Earth really matters, and um, he is involved in uh, numerous projects. But uh, some of them include. Uh, just want to mention some of them. Uh, he is managing Global Sustainability Prize. He also leads the development of Dubai's climate change adaptation strategy on energy, food, and financial services. Um, and uh, he uh, manages uh, many, many more projects. Uh, I really, uh, I read the abstract for this talk and uh, I'm really interested in this uh, topic because as I mentioned, I am uh, co-directing the environmental uh, education project called Global Forest Link. And we just uh, recently uh, submitted a proposal to NOAA uh, to involve youth into building community resilience uh, to climate change. And uh, uh, the big portion of this proposal is to teach youth how to uh, use the uh, Earth observation data and combine it with uh, citizen science uh, in order to help local communities to improve their policies in the face of the climate change. So um, I'm really uh, look, look forward to the nice Great, thank you very much for the generous introduction, Elena. Much appreciated. Welcome, everybody. Um, uh, I know this is the last session of the day in this room, so we're saving the best for last. I'm sure you'll, I hope you agree by the end of that. We have a great um, uh, list of panels, uh, speakers, to, to joining uh, through, the, through the webinar and the remote link. So it'll be a good test of the technology. Um, I'd like to also thank Ajidi for um, all the tireless efforts, especially to Derek and Jane and to Ahmed for all the efforts they put into organizing this and giving us this space to, to present and have a good dialogue with you all today. Um, I established, um, this all, event's been all co-organized with um, my organization, Earth Matters Consulting and Acclimatize Limited. Uh, we've been working together on different projects in the past. Um, my company's uh, relatively new, it's a startup, less than a year old, so we're learning a lot. We work on strategy, policy, communications, advisory services on climate change and sustainability for government, private sector, and NGOs. Um, I've worked in the NGO sector for over the last kind of 12, 13 years, um, even in this region as well, uh, which can be a challenge, um, but also with lots of opportunities. So um, why would, did we choose to organize this event? So I'm gonna give a quick introduction to this before we're handing over to the, to the esteemed panelists. So I've been working in the field of climate change for over the last 15 years. And I remember when it was first introduced to me at the time, they were saying, oh, it's kind of tomorrow's problem. And now it's today's problem. And don't let anyone tell you that it's actually tomorrow's problem anymore because the world is facing severe impacts. The scientific data has been clear for a number of years, for many decades actually, yet the media is still reporting there's more increased incidences of floods, disasters, more intense hurricanes, heat waves, droughts, crop failures. It's hard to look away from the media and think, what can we do about it? How can we actually make this problem a be a be better for the world? Uh, how could we improve the situation? So, um, and it can be, it can feel quite disempowering sometimes. But also, I'd say, you know, it sometimes might feel like we've been there before when the warning, uh, when the alarm bells are ringing. But actually, while the impacts are getting more intense, there's also more and more solutions that are getting mainstream. So there's opportunity and hope there. Um, I don't need to go into the details of it, but you can look at mitigation technologies like renewable energy and the record low prices that are happening around the world and the investments that are going into this, the creation of new jobs and economy, uh, new development kind of paradigms are completely changing. So there's a lot of opportunity if the solutions can be scaled up at the level needed to actually address the problem. There's a window of opportunity though, and I have to say the urgency of the matter has never been so stark. So when the Paris Agreement was agreed in 2015, 
it made it very clear that the goal that we want to limit warming to is between one and a half to two degrees. We knew back then the pledges that were on the table were not sufficient to actually achieve those goals. We're actually aiming for a world which will be about three or four degrees during the century. The recent IPCC report that was released, which was looking at the difference in the impacts and the level of action that's needed to limit to one and a half degrees versus two degrees, is calling for much more urgent action. Uh, we need to essentially reduce to net zero emissions by the year 2050. A scale, the scale, and a lot of those changes need to happen in the next 12 years by 2030 with uh, the Sustainable Development Goals come to maturity. Um, yet, even if we stopped emitting tomorrow, we're still locked into a certain degree of warming because that's how the climate system works, is there's a certain degree of warming and impacts that we still have to adapt to. So, um, and this is where the intersection with Earth observation data is a very exciting area. So Earth observation data isn't just about satellite data and imagery, it's about in situ on the ground data as well. And this, it has a massive untapped potential in terms of its use to actually inform better decisions on climate change and better investments. So we got together and thought about, well, we want to actually share with the community how can we actually use our Earth observation data to unlock investment decisions, better investments in climate change? Share with you some examples and case studies of how this has worked before, um, economic and socioeconomic data and the, um, the impact that it has on improving these areas as well. And ultimately, how can it be used to benefit people and some of the challenges that we face? So we have a really good panel today. Um, the format of it will be where we have four panelists, two, two on stage and two remotely. Um, they'll each have 10 minutes to present. And there'll be some clarification questions that the audience will be able to ask. I can help to moderate that. We have an online audience as well um, who are welcome to ask questions as well, so please feel free to send them through. We'll have a panel discussion where there are, we, I have a few uh, prepared questions for the panelists but also given uh, we have a nice intimate audience here this, uh, this evening, I'd like to open it out to all of you to, to ask questions as well. So we'll see where that, where that goes. We have, a, I think, an hour and a half left of the, the session. So I'm sure we have plenty of rich content to discuss. So first, I'd like to invite Stephen Ramage, who we met for the first time yesterday. We've been talking on the phone. Um, I know a lot of you will know Stephen already with his, in his role at GEO. He's been involved in this space for uh, many, many years, uh, helping to set up private companies, working with intergovernmental organizations and others. He brings a wealth of knowledge and ex expertise in this area. So Stephen, I'd like to pass over to you first to make a few comments in your presentation. Thank you for coming. Thank you for staying. Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the work that GEO does. I'm going to talk about um, resources that are available. And I'm gonna talk quite a lot about the concept of essential variables. So anyone who's been involved in the climate area will know about essential climate variables, ECVs, which are essentially key measurements for being able to look at change. There are other types of essential variables that we're working on uh, essential agricultural variables, essential water variables, essential biodiversity variables. So I'll cover some of these as we go on. Um, okay, um, you've just hidden my slides, but that's okay. Um, sorry, can you put it back so I can see my slides? Uh, so I don't have to keep turning in. Thank you. So what, what I'll start with is essentially um, the work of GEO is to help countries, so I can see this, thank you. Okay, perfect, thank you. Thanks a lot. So when we, when we talk about Earth observations, um, as Tanzi said, it's not just satellite imagery. We're also talking about anything we can measure in, on, or around the Earth. So a lot of the work that we're doing, yes, it's with um, organizations that provide satellite imagery. Um, so we've been using Landsat, and now we have Sentinel from the Copernicus program. 
uh, there's MODIS, there's all these other types of, of satellite data, but we also look at the in situ data, so the data collected in place. So those data could be uh, soil moisture, groundwater, ocean acidification, different types of uh, sensors that measure that data. So it's really important when we talk about Earth observations, we're talking about a broad range of, of different types of data. In terms of geo, we've been around for over a decade. So before lots of people started to understand the value of Earth observations, we've been doing this and trying to, to bang this drum. And now suddenly there's like a, a huge understanding and everybody wants to be part of it. So the first thing I'd say is we've worked on data sharing and data management principles for Earth observations, for open data, for five years. So all these people who say, hey, we need all these different principles for sharing, we have them. Don't reinvent them, use ours, share them. That's my first message. Um, we've been in existence really to help promote the value and usefulness of Earth observations, particularly open Earth observations for research policy and decision making. So this is where we represent over 100 UN member states so that they get that guidance and that advice from the geo community. So we all get to work together and we work on that on that basis. So this is really important because we represent the member states, but we have what are called participating organizations, and those are effectively partners. So there's 126 of those, one of them sitting right there, UN Environment, pretty big organization, the World Bank's another one, uh, European Space Agency is another one. So these are big organizations that we try to work with to make sure that we support the countries while working with these organizations to try and coordinate the activities. So it's a big coordination piece as well as a kind of technical and technology guidance piece. And the goal of GEO is to build this global Earth observation system of systems. So being able to coordinate Earth observations globally, internationally across a number of what we call societal benefit areas. So agriculture, biodiversity, climate, disasters, energy, forestry, all these different areas. So that's really what we do. Um, we've been building an open data platform, um, which is the, the GEOS platform, which has 400 million, more than 400 million open data resources in there that anybody can access and download. And at the moment, there's 7,000 data providers providing all that data. Like I said, it's openly accessible and usable. But we are re-architecting that. So um, to make all of this kind of sensible, we have a work program where all the work takes the data, where we look at how do we apply open earth observation data and information. And in the work program, we have 70 different activities. So like I said, the satellite imagery stuff we've been doing for many years, the key challenge now is to get the in situ data. So how do we get different research organizations, different governments and different people who are working with it to openly share and make that accessible? Um, and this is something where we, we hope to work with Amazon and others to, to, to start to share that information. So to focus that activity, we work on policy areas. So we work on many different policy areas, probably about 10 or 15 different policy areas, but the focus ones for us are the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, and the Paris Agreement. So, in terms of, um, one of one of the leading one of the 74 that we work on that's most relevant for this discussion is called EO for SDG Earth Observations for Sustainable Development Goals. And in there, we're working with a number of different custodian agencies to develop the indicators using Earth observations. So for example, working in Colombia, we worked with Danny, the National Statistical Office, and they did some work where they took the national statistical data for 2005, 2010, 2015, and they took the open Landsat satellite imagery data for the same period, and they worked on indicator 11.3.1, .1, so to look at population growth at the same time as looking at land use change. And so they could report on that. So that's the kind of thing we're working on. So 6.6.1 on, on uh, spatial extent of water, 14.1.1 um, on eutrophication and oceans. So many different areas are where we're working. And EO for SDG is the organization within GEO that leads all of those activities. In terms of the Paris Agreement, what we're doing is we're working with a lot of the existing organizations so the Global Carbon Observing System, the World Meteorological Organization, ICOS, 
you know that this whole area is like full of acronyms so forgive me if i if i end up getting into acronym speak but essentially what we're doing is we're trying to work to look at where are the different observing systems and where are the observations coming from so for ocean it's very well covered and for atmosphere it's very well covered but for land there's a big gap so this is another area where we're looking at terrestrial observations this is another challenge for us but what we're doing is we're looking at different areas of the Paris Agreement, the articles of the Paris Agreement, and where Earth observations can be mapped against the Paris Agreement, the articles of the Paris Agreement. And so there's a, there's a big community working on that within, within GEO. And I should probably add, GEO, because we represent over 100 countries, we have something like a 1,000 national government agencies who are in some way, shape, or form signed up to GEO. So many of them are active, some of them are just contact people in the database, but the idea is to get as many uh, organizations as possible thinking about how we can use Earth observations for these different policy areas. So the Geocarbon and Greenhouse Gas Initiative, again, is about looking at the different ways of measuring greenhouse gas and who's doing it and where are the overlaps and where are the complementary areas. Uh, and this is there's a white paper coming out in November that will be the first iteration of the work that's going on here and it'll go out for public review. Uh, GeoGlam is something like 400 different um, partners and this is looking at two areas. So this came out of the G20 meeting in 2011 where the ministers of agriculture wanted to have a way to look at market price fluctuations and volatility. And so they, they wanted a mechanism to look at um, how they could do crop monitoring as well as feed into early warning systems. So that's what GeoGlam has been doing since that time. So it's now a big network. Um, it feeds into the agricultural market information system, which is run by FAO. And it was used recently in uh, Karamoja in Uganda for early warning. So they were actually able to look at what was going to happen based on the forecast and evacuate people out of an area. So they moved 150,000 people and saved a lot of money and, and, and potentially a loss of life. Um, GFOI is looking at the um, national forest assessments and how that can feed into the work of UNFCCC on uh, national greenhouse gas inventories. Um, there's also Global Forest Watch with my buddy Francis over here from WRI. So again, this is, this is something that was successful in GEO and it got taken out of GEO and it's now managed by FAO. So FAO run the GFOI secretariat. But again, um, there's something called CEOS, the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, and CEOS now provides satellite data for the whole world to provide the forestry data as open data. So again, a, a, a big news item for GFOI. Um, GeoBon is the Biodiversity Observation Network, again, working with IPBES. Um, I'm not going to go through all the acronyms, but those of you who know that, you know, looking um, with the Convention on Biological Diversity, they have recognition there. And again, here they're working on essential biodiversity variables, EBVs. So what I was saying about key key ways to key measurements for for change. So that's for biodiversity change. Um, this also has um, a number of other projects under it. So Marine Bond, looking at marine biodiversity observation networks and 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 others. The point I'm trying to get across with all these different activities is within the work program within these 70 different activities there are many different communities and these communities are all large, they're experts, they're open, they're interoperable, they're all sharing data and information. How am I doing on time? Um, GeoBlue Planet is another one of the areas looking at 14.1.1 and some of the other things looking at things like plastic pollution. So um, NASA is working on looking at kind of patches that are, and so is ESA and others, looking at patches that would be 10 meters within the ocean, they can then see if they can start to drill through those and get below the ocean level. So there's some, some heavy scientific work going on in that area. And then looking at how, how do those patches move? So where do the patches come from and where do they go to? And can you attribute um, an origin or, or blame for, for these, these activities? Um, the GOLDN, the Land Degradation Neutrality, so UNCCD, the Convention to Combat Desertification, and if I get any of these wrong, please allow me that. UNCCD came to GEO and said, 
deal, you have a community, you have some methodologies and some activities that are all underway, would you help us look at developing 15.3.1 based on Earth observations and work collaboratively with us? So that's what we've done. We've created the Geo LDN initiative. And so this now has scores of countries. Um, UNCCD told me last week, 150 countries have now responded to them, telling them they're looking at Earth observations as part of their methodology. For, for me, that's a staggering number. That's like a huge, huge progress in terms of Earth observations. So um, I've got a few more slides to go. Geohuman Planet is looking at a global human settlement layer. Um, believe it or not, there's no global definition of cities. I don't know if you know that. I didn't know that. They're working on that. Um, they're looking at things like pop grid, world pop, and lots of other things that are looking at settlement layers and, and population distribution, population statistics. Um, and then we have GeoGlows. Um, and Michael, who's on the line, maybe he can talk a wee bit about that because that's been led by NOAA, who are working with ECMWF and others to look at um, surface water flow and, and some other things. So GeoGlows is the global water sustainability stuff. And then um, GOS4M is looking at Mercury, so using um, a lot of in situ um, data for that. So I'm just wrapping up. Really what I wanted to say is that within the framework of what we do, there are these four Cs. Um, something I feel very strongly about, and it's a really crappy term, I'm really sorry, but human interoperability. If you look at interoperability, there's a gazillion things on standards, on data, on uh, you know, all types of interoperability. There's almost nothing in terms of literature on human interoperability. Now, maybe it comes under collaboration, I don't know, or cooperation, but I think for this kind of like technical community who's thinking about data, it'd be really good to think about human interoperability. Um, we also talk a lot about, instead of capacity building, trying to think more about co-design and co-production of knowledge. So instead of people zooming in, doing some training and leaving again, we actually do it much more collaboratively. And then finally, um, you know, we're, we're looking a lot at commercial engagement. So um, Amazon's already supporting us on the Geos platform, and hopefully, we'll have a fairly big announcement to make in the coming weeks or months um, in terms of engagement there. So we have our plenary next week. We get um, all the countries come together, all the participating organizations come together, and we talk in real detail, real nitty gritty, techy, uber geeky ways about all this stuff. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, are there any um, clarification questions for Stephen based on what he's presented? We can go into more details later on in the audience Q&A in the panel, but anything to clarify based on what Stephen presented? Any questions? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry for the online audience. <laughs> no, I'm not sure if you heard that one. Okay. Are there any other um, clarification questions for Stephen before we move on? I don't. I can't see the online questions if there are any, but I trust you'll you'll fire them across to me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. So now next we have Jed. Uh, Jed Sunwall, who's the global open data lead from Amazon. Um, Jed and I, again, we met for the first time yesterday, and within a couple of minutes, we started talking about what movies he watched on the plane. So uh, that was actually, it just shows how um, <laughs> how there are common interests that we have beyond the, the nerdy nature of the work we might all be involved in. But uh, Jed's actually, I mean, uh, joking aside, he's been, he's doing some really interesting work as the lead of Global Open Data Program at Amazon Web Services. Um, I'm reading off his bio, which researches ways that the AWS cloud can make data easier to discover, access, and use. Now, when I first heard about Jed's work, I was thinking, what does Amazon do on open data for climate change? And actually, that was the challenge we gave him to, to present to us on this in this area today. But he has actually, through his career, he's used the internet to improve the quality of governance around the world through work with NOAA, the World Bank, the US State Department, NASA, the European Space Agency, and my past employers, the Worldwide Fund for Nature. So great, Jed, over Thank to you. you. Thank you. So I decided to go uh, full nerd with the, the presentation title today. Normally I just talk about 
democratizing access to data. But I want to talk, and since we're talking about making investments, um, this notion that, that we use sometimes on our team, uh, which is lowering the cost of knowledge, which is, is kind of one of our, our uber goals, is, is to lower the cost of knowledge in the world. And uh, so, so to kick things off, I, I always like to share this quote from Bill Joy, uh, who is he was the co-founder of Sun Microsystems. And uh, he said, he said, no matter who you are, most of the smartest people in the world work for someone else. I think I it. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So we, we accept this as, as fact, like kind of, we assume this is sort of like a law of physics, that no matter what organization you're in, no matter how many smart people you have, most of the smartest people work external to your organization. Now, when Joy said this, he was talking about open source software. And the idea was that if you're producing software, uh, you might stand to benefit from open, opening up the code. Because if you have a lot of people working on it with you, uh, you might have a lot of smart people using it that, that, that uh, require use of it. And if there are bugs, you're going to have a lot more people that you can work with uh, to, to squash those bugs and make better software. Um, we think the same thing applies to data. And the idea being that if, if you're producing some sort of data asset, if you're going through the trouble of, I don't know, having a space program um, and launching satellites, you're investing a ton of money in producing these data assets. You want to make sure that as many smart people as possible can access these things and, and derive value from them and find insights from them. Now, so to Tanzeed's point, you know, what does AWS have to do with this? We have, so for those of you that don't know, AWS is Amazon Web Services and it's cloud computing. We provide cloud computing infrastructure uh, to, you know, over a million customers all over the world. A lot of those are in the public sector. Uh, a lot of those within the public sector have requirements either by law or it's just their mission to share data. They want to get data out there uh, to the scientific community. And then on the other hand, uh, so that's sort of the supply side of data that, that happens in AWS. On the demand side, we have a lot of customers uh, who rely on access to that data to, to build their own services. Um, so, you know, Esri's been very active here. You know, Esri's a big AWS customer. Certainly Esri without open data uh, would be a much less useful product. It's a great product, but with, with open data, it's, it's tremendously useful. So what, so what do we do to democratize access to data? What is our, our position here? So we tend to focus on acquisition, with the challenges of data acquisition. And when we're talking about large volumes of data, uh, acquiring the data can be really burdensome. So before the cloud, if you wanted to work with 100 terabytes of data, you needed to have 100 terabytes of disk space. And you would have to figure out how to get the data. Uh, if you're lucky, uh, if you have a really good internet connection, like Dubai has like amazing internet connectivity. But so like, even in Dubai, with, with great uh, internet speeds, Downloading 100 terabytes of data would take about 100, 150, 200 days, right? So a lot of people just don't do it. And we know that there's what I call a lot of uh, latent research out there in the world. where There are researchers, there are scientists, there are all these smart people that work for all these different organizations that have ideas uh, of what they could do with data and questions they'd like to ask, and they just never get past step zero. They never, they're like, well, first step to answering this question is acquiring 100 terabytes of data. I guess I'll think of something else to do because I'm never going to do that. Um, so what we try to do is uh, get rid of the burden of acquiring data by making data available for analysis in the cloud. And we actually, so I always share this quote uh, from, uh, there's a little book called Data Driven uh, by DJ Patil and Hillary Mason, where they, they, coin, they say that 80% of a data scientist's work is spent uh, preparing data for analysis. I don't know what like actual research they did to come up with that number, so take it with a grain of salt, but it seems right. Every, you know, I, usually people agree. Um, it takes a lot of work to just get data ready to analyze. And we actually have a term for this kind of work uh, at Amazon, this drudgery. We call it undifferentiated heavy lifting. So undifferentiated heavy lifting is all the stuff that you have to do that you wish you didn't have to do before you could actually do the stuff you want to do, right? Before you could do the stuff that you're actually good at and the stuff that differentiates you. And again, our perspective is that if data is available in the cloud, rather than getting your own copy and downloading it and taking one way of saying it is taking the data down to your algorithms, so down to your local compute resources where you, you can analyze it, deploy compute uh, resources next to the data in the cloud. And this is this sounds very simplistic, but it's it's true, and I'll explain why. If the data doesn't have to move as far, you can work with it much more quickly, right? And if you can access it without, without actually having to store your own copy, uh, that lowers the cost of research dramatically. Now, one way that we, we test this out is we have this thing called the Public Dataset Program, where we collaborate with data providers uh, all over the world 
who have data that they want to share, and we, we help them uh, stage it for analysis in AWS and make it make it openly available. And uh, you can you can see a, a list of the data sets that we have available at registry.opendata.aws. So, but today I'm going to talk about Earth on AWS briefly. Which so a few years ago we started looking at Landsat data, and uh, we started opening up satellite imagery. And you can see a lot of the stuff that we're doing with Earth data at uh, aws.amazon.com/earth if you're interested. But I'm, I'm not going to go into too many details on this slide. But we started looking at how people accessed and worked with Landsat data. And we found that a lot of people were having to transfer data uh, from USGS's servers that they didn't need when performing analysis. Uh, they would have to, you know, they'd bring in uh, quality assurance data or infrared data that they didn't necessarily need um, and other things before they could actually get to work. And so we, we started working. We sort of built a coalition of people. We worked with Mapbox. We worked with Esri. We worked with uh, Planet Labs. Digital Globe. Uh, it was really great. We got a bunch of people together, and we, we started thinking about how else could we do this. And uh, what what we came up with was what's now called the cloud optimized geotiff. And we made the data available in a way that was is much much easier to access, much more precisely. And this is just sort of one result that we we have one graph with somebody that that somebody made for us. Drew Bollinger from Development Seed uh, sh shared this with us, and it sort of blew our minds. Where you know, he was accessing data the old way, where he was down, he'd have to transfer all this data before he could actually open it up and do what he wanted with it, to what we provided, which allowed him to just access just the data he wanted when he wanted it. And what you'll see in this plot, there are 90,000 points here. Uh, and the, the old way of doing it, you can't really see the, the axes. Maybe I should fix the slide someday. I've been presenting this slide for like two years, and I should just make the slide easier to read. But, <laughs> On the left side, it's like the old way of doing it would take about 350, 400 seconds to do the analysis. He's doing vegetation analysis on Landsat scenes. Most of that's just transferring data. Each scene, each time, just most of the time would be spent transferring the data. As soon as we were able to get rid of that, and it dropped down to like 20 something seconds. And we did the math and figured out what, what's represented here. If he had to do it all the old way, it would have taken him 250 days longer. That's one person who saved 250 days. There are thousands of Landsat users. So we think about you know how. This, this is what I talk about with lowering the cost of knowledge. How much time is it going to take you to find the answer that you need? Is it going to, you know, it could take you 250 days longer. How much is a data scientist's salary for 250 days? It's a lot of money. And so what, what we're trying to figure out is how can we make it much, much cheaper for people to just ask questions? And uh, we think it's pretty, we've seen some interesting results. So, so this is a great graph that sort of shows what it looks like in terms of time. Um, I want to sort of riff a little bit on, on what Steven said about human interoperability. Once people have access to the data and can, and also it's available in the cloud, they can even build services and interfaces on top of it. And one way that I think about, I think what Stephen's talking about with interoperability is sense making. Like, how do we actually get this data into a format that actually makes sense to anybody? Uh, user interface design, uh, you know, application design, creating software that act, people can actually use is incredibly difficult. I, I don't know if any of you have ever built software. It is one of the worst experiences of your life to build a piece of software and then to watch somebody try to use it. It's because they will never, they don't know what you know. They haven't approached it the way that you built it. And uh, it's called user testing. And it's excruciating. And it's super important. And it takes a lot of time. And if, you, if it's really expensive to even try to build an application because you have to get data in the first place, you're not going to do it. So what we're trying to do is by, by expanding access to this data, we can get all sorts of creative people uh, like this is a guy named Vincent Sirago at, at Mapbox, who can just will have crazy ideas of things that you can do um, to, to make it easier to work with this data. This is a little browser for Landsat data that, that creates composite images in real time in the browser. It's phenomenal. Uh, similarly, the Zooniverse uh, Planetary Response Network, they're able to use the data uh, to, to create interfaces that people can use to, to crowdsource uh, information about you know, change analysis after disaster, you know, disaster events and hurricanes. Uh, which is another example of, of sense making and you know, creating interfaces that people can actually use to interact with the data and find stuff from. And then, of course, um, you may have heard about it. I think there's some, some discussion about it this week, the African Regional Data Cube, which is another application uh, of Earth observation data that's, that's being built in AWS to make data easier for people to work with. Now, there are other data sets that we work on. Uh, OpenStreetMap is one uh, where we're, we're Trying to figure out again how to how to lower the cost of knowledge. How are you going to how could you derive answers out of OpenStreetMap data? Uh, typically, running an OpenStreetMap database is 
it's not easy. It, it takes like a day or two of work uh, if you really know what you're doing. Uh, but we make the OpenStreetMap data available in the cloud in a way that you can just write a SQL query and get answers from it. So this is a query that would give you all health centers in uh, King of Sierra Leone and Liberia. You get the result in a few seconds. It might cost you a few pennies, which is really cool. And then I'm just going to skip ahead. I want to give a shout out to um, NTEI and NOAA. These are cool slides, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to talk about them. This is cool. Uh, we, we saw this, this publication came out in Nature just a few weeks ago with this line that really surprised us that said, you know, uh, NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and Amazon Web Services, made available one of the largest data sets describing animal movement ever compiled. We read this and we're like, we did? Like, I, I don't think if you ask us or anybody at NOAA, or, you know, we read this and we're like, well, I didn't know that we did that. Like, who did that? And they're like, no, it's, it's, it's next right. It's the radar data. And uh, what happens when you democratize access to data and expand the access to data to unexpected people is you'll get these unexpected awesome results. What these guys did is a group of ornithologists, it's a group of researchers at Cornell University that used weather radar data. We have this huge archive of weather radar data to track bird migration at continent scale uh, over decades. Now this is just science fiction to them a long time. They knew the data existed. They knew that this radar data existed, but they could just never get it. And suddenly when they're able to get it, they're, they're, they said, oh my goodness, we've been wondering this forever. Now we can find the answers. And they found the answers into this continental scale uh, bird migration analysis. And it's, it's really gratifying to be uh, so surprised by, by the results that come from, from opening up access to data. So look forward to discussing this with you today. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Um, before going to the next speaker, are there are one or two clarification questions for Jed based on what he presented. Again, with the Stephen has a question for you. He didn't plan this one, by the way. Yeah, if you stand next. Wait, Stephen, you have a question. You have a question? Well, more, more, more of a comment on the undifferentiated heavy lifting. Yeah. The uh, like you Africa Regional Data Cube. Yeah. Uh, so Africa Regional Data Cube is all about providing analysis ready data. So it's making it much easier for people to use the data. So the so the the pre-processing, the calibration, the validation, all of that stuff's done up front so that the data is just delivered. Right. And NASA, Brian Kilo from NASA was telling me at lunch that something that used to take them a month and a half, they're now doing 15 minutes. Yeah. And so these these gains have a, have a massive economic impact in terms of what, what yeah. you were saying. So I just wanted to put that in there before we continue, not to forget to mention that. In terms of like, because if you can start to do these kind of efforts, then you can start to manage the data much better, and then you can start to make the decisions much faster, which obviously will help us because, like you're saying, time's running out. So, thank you, Stephen. Anyone else for a quick clarification? Peter, at the back. If you can state your name and organization as well, please. Before you. I'm Peter Farrington, Environment Department, Dubai Municipality. I'm just wondering if there's any concerns been expressed about security if you're doing this kind of research in the cloud. Uh, anybody concerned about this? So security with regards to your own applications? Or? Yeah, the applications, yeah. the research, the outcomes, your, your results. Right. So, um, so in the cloud, the, what we talk about at AWS is a, a shared responsibility model. So, so we manage the security of the actual infrastructure, like the data centers and the servers and things like that. Um, whatever applications you're building, everything is sort of locked down by default. Uh, so it, but your responsibility for whatever applications you build and deploy, securing those, right? So if you have, if you deploy a, a server that's, uh, you know, accessible over the internet and you use admin, admin as your password and stuff like that, that's that's your choice, <laughs> right? So there's a shared responsibility model that goes with that, but we have a, a multitude of security features to help people run applications securely uh, in the cloud and, and, and monitor those things. And you can encrypt your data and everything like that. But you And you also own your data and have complete control over it, uh, as well as your, your algorithm and things you use. We don't, we don't see any of that stuff. Jane, you had a question as well? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
possibly. Um, yeah, so we, we evaluate every data set that we bring on, and, and we can have a conversation with you about that. So yeah, happy to. Yes, sir, there's a question. And one more, and then we have to okay. go to the next one here. Thank you. This is, this is just for clarification, just sure. to make this clear. So you said that when somebody puts data in your cloud, in the Amazon right. cloud, you you are not this is your data and you are, so Amazon has nothing to do with its data. So this is very different to Google, right? Mm -hmm. If I understand it correctly, because Google is not um, guaranteeing that. So Google can actually access some of the data where you store things on Google. Right. This can be accessed by Google, but you are saying that for the Amazon uh, um, cloud, you, you make sure and you guarantee that this is your space and you will not read any any data is that, that correct that's Just correct to, so yeah so there's yeah. yes that's correct i can't i don't know anything about google's policies but from our perspective when you host data on aws it's it is your data you're the owner of it we don't want to have take any ownership of it at all that's that's not our, our model we just provide the infrastructure so. and we have one more question from the online audience huh. really? is that right can we have the question please Hear it? I'm breathing. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. We can hear you. We can hear you. Wait, that's me. <laughs> uh, can we just come to that? The question is. Um, are there tutorials available to use and process Amazon Web Service open data? And that's from uh, Swita Koluri. Okay. Um, so yeah, yeah, there are a lot of tutorials. That's actually, uh, we don't really measure ourselves in the data sets we host. We measure ourselves in tutorials because if people are actually gonna write tutorials about the data sets, we know we're doing something good. Uh, if you go to registry.opendata.aws, that's one of the, the URL that I, I shared in the slides. There's a link on there that says, usage examples or see all usage examples. Every data set that's on there, almost every data set has some sort of usage example, which oftentimes includes tutorials and things like that. So you can find stuff there. And then, you know, and my email address is on here. I don't want to take uh, more time now, but please email me if you have any questions. I'm always happy to, to talk to people. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ed. Now we have um, uh, Dr. Michael Brewer, who's the Chief Customer Enga Chief of Customer Engagement from NOAA's National Center for Environmental Information and the Center for Weather and Climate. Um, Mike, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, great. Thank you for joining us. We have your presentation here, so you'll need to tell me when to um, switch slides. Yeah, so we're going to beam it on screen now. Just, just bear with me. Sounds great. Will do. All right. So while they're pulling that up, I'll mention um, that I appreciate Jared's comments and that part about uh, bird migrations it just goes to show you how important open data is. Uh, because from our standpoint in NOAA, we're looking at rain and snow and hail. Uh, and we can, we've known about the fact that you can see birds in, in the radar data for a long time, but it's usually something that we want to filter out so that we don't tell you that there is a, an intense precipitation event happening and you're liable to see flooding uh, when in fact it's the evening and birds are taking off or, or nesting uh, on the ground. So just a great example of how different people can use data in different ways and certainly in different ways from the way it was intended. All right, are we good to go? Thank you, Mike. I was going to give you an introduction because I saw your bio and what I really liked about it that stood out was in July 2015, you were Weather Channel Geek of the Week. That's quite impressive. <laughs> that, that's and, um, my one claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then, apart from that, he's, uh, he's a, got an illustrious record. I won't go through all the details here, but Mike's a physical scientist with NCI in Asheville, in North Carolina. Um, He's responsible for connecting the users and customers to the data they need to make decisions and conduct their businesses or address their issues. I won't go into any more details because I've seen a preview of Mike's presentation and he's got some really interesting info here for you. So Mike, over to you. Thank you. 
Excellent. Thank you. So I am from NOAA, a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and I'm part of NCEI, the National Centers for Environmental Information. I'm part of the group that used to be the National Climatic Data Center. Uh, when we first started our interactions with GEO and, and other folks, we were under that moniker, but we've since integrated our, our data centers. So uh, we've pulled together the climate and weather side with the oceans, the coasts, and the geophysics side um, to create what is potentially one of the uh, world's largest environmental information uh, sources. Uh, and all of our data, one of the important points here, all of our data is available openly and for free through our website. So if you would go to our the next slide, please, I will uh, mention that we ingest a tremendous amount of data, uh, petabytes a year, uh, from everything from satellite information. We have uh, satellite data that just came in a couple of minutes ago from our GOES and JPSS satellites uh, to weather observations that are taken both automatically and manually and come in once a day. Uh, to ice cores and tree rings uh, that are hundreds and even millions of years old. Uh, and we archive all this data to give you a consistent and, and long look at the climate, not just of the U.S., but of the world. One of the important things that we do, uh, I guess if, if this was a therapy session, I would say, hi, I'm Mike Brewer. I am a heavy, undif undifferentiated heavy lifter. Uh, a lot of what we do in our organization is take care of that 80%, moving from a raw observation into a data set or a product that is useful to someone for making a decision. Um, and here's some of the ways that we do that. Our product suite spans the time frame from near real time. You can get some of the, the raw information from us, uh, but all the way out to the decadal and centennial uh, scales. Uh, and from the local scale, where you are, out to both the U.S. and the globe. And in this slide is just a couple of examples of the products that we put together from the raw data that comes in uh, from all over the world. So we do some snowfall information. If you look at that top left corner uh, on the short time frame uh, that is used by our uh, emergency management folks here in the U.S. to do disaster response, uh, and as you move further uh, to the right, uh, the time scale increases and you see things like heating and cooling degree days is useful to the energy sector, uh, to temperature and precipitation outlooks that help with agriculture and all the way out to uh, our billion dollar disaster products um, that are used by folks like insurance uh, to train their catastrophe models and determine how much folks pay for reinsurance. Um, and as you go down to both the national and global scale, uh, many of you might be familiar with some flavor of the drought monitor. We have a US version, we have a North American version. Uh, and in my uh, life before what I'm doing now, I kept track of the uh, global drought information system uh, under the auspices of GEO and WMO, uh, where we had some global drought monitoring activities going on. And these things ultimately uh, culminate in, in assessments. So as you move to the right, you'll see things like our monthly state of the climate report, both for the US and the world, uh, but also in terms of the annual state of the climate, uh, we're kind of the ringleaders of that. It's published in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society every year, uh, but it's 400 authors representing 70 countries that take the pulse of the planet and describe what's happening every year and that feeds into things like our national climate assessment, which in turn feeds into activities like IPCC uh, in terms of conditions and trends. So if you would go to the next slide, here's just an example. When it pops up, this is the billion dollar disaster uh, product that we do. There's numbers and you know a lot more detail that goes in with this, but this is kind of the one slide snapshot of 2017 where we had $16 billion disasters that impacted the US from the trifecta of hurricanes that rolled over Puerto Rico and Florida and, and Texas, especially uh, in Houston, uh, to the fires and the flooding in California. Um, this is unusual. We usually have five to six of them. If you look over the long term, uh, something a little higher if you look over just the last five or 10 years. 
Um, but in terms of uh, 2017, it was a pretty unusual year. And this is an example of turning the raw data into a product and service that's easy to digest. Uh, if you go on to the next slide, since what we're talking about here is the uses and applications of our data, I want to spend a little bit of time uh, it, talking about some of the things that we found out about who's using our data and, and some of the benefits that they're getting back from it. And I hope I don't steal any of John's thunder, who's uh, going to speak next, uh, because we work very closely with John in teasing out some of these numbers and some of these uses. And, and it's a fantastic partnership between uh, we and the federal government and John in, in the private sector um, to come to a more thorough understanding than we would have on our own, uh, just because he's able to reach into different places than we are. So here's an example, San Diego Gas and Electric. A couple of years ago, uh, some dry downsloping winds off of the mountains uh, created tremendously dry uh, conditions. Uh, some sparks from some power transformers ultimately set off a series of fires that destroyed about a thousand homes, uh, businesses, you know, the thousands of acres. Um, and as they went through the legal system, uh, they were sued, of course, uh, for the losses and ultimately they were found liable for the damage to the tune of about $2 billion. Uh, so they came for our information so that they could put together a model of the conditions that were happening at the time. Uh, and that combined with uh, the incorporation of weather forecasts allowed them to see when these conditions are gonna happen. And ironically, what they discovered was that they happen at least once a year uh, and they developed the mitigation strategy to do rolling brownouts, uh, power outages to keep the uh, the electrical sparking from happening. And since that, since they started that policy, uh, they haven't had an incident where they've been sued and and had to pay out any money. So they went on record uh, to say, "You guys save us two billion dollars a year because that's how much one of these events costs us uh, when it happens, and we know that it's got the potential to happen every year." So that's one company, uh, $2 billion. If you would go to the next slide, uh, here's some other information that uh, Acclimatize has helped us understand the logistics and transport industry. You know, these are the FedEx, UPS, DHLs of the world, as well as uh, railroad uh, service providers. And uh, in talking with them, uh, we found that there was a tremendous use of a, one product from NCEI, which actually incorporates a whole lot of data. International Station Meteorological Climate Summary. It's a little bit old now. We're looking at updating it, uh, but FedEx and UPS uh, both use that to make decisions like which airport should they uh, make a, a hub? Should they go into uh, Tallahassee or should, like, should they go into Destin uh, in Florida if they wanna get into that, uh, have a transportation area in Florida? They'll look at things like when does the fog lift in the morning? Uh, when do the winds calm down so that you can land planes effectively? And how much rain is there so you can unload cargo? Uh, things like that. It's a one and a half trillion dollar business, uh, and it's expected to grow four or five fold in the coming five years or so. So uh, to have uh, our information be integral to the way they do business, when they land planes, uh, that sort of thing is, is pretty awe-inspiring, actually. Uh, if you go to the next slide, here's another example from the agricultural community. This is one of the first ones uh, that Acclimatize did for us, and they went and talked to just corn producers in the United States, and they talked to a private it's a combination of academia and private sector that put together a precision nitrogen model based on our global historical climatology network data, uh, station data uh, from not just around the, the country, but from around the world. And what they found was you know, through testing and the development of this model, that if it was adopted by all the farmers in the U.S., there would be a $2.7 billion benefit uh, to the farming community in terms of lower uh, cost for fertilizer, increased production, that sort of thing. And there was an ancillary benefit, kind of like the birds in the radar. Uh, if you put less nitrogen on your fields, there's less nitrogen that rolls down the rivers, which then has to be cleaned up by municipal water supplies, 
uh, which costs about a billion and a half dollars a year, a little over that. That would be a, a side benefit of following this uh, guidance in this tool. And this tool was actually just recently bought by an international company who's looking at expanding it to things beyond corn and areas beyond the United States. So if you go to the next slide, please. Another example from the retail industry uh, that uses our state of the climate reports and folks like Conagra, which is a large food uh, provider who stock shelves in a lot of grocery stores and big box stores in the United States. They look at trends in regional weather and climate to figure out when they should put things like stewed tomatoes uh, on the shelves because they know that stewed tomatoes sell when it gets cold. And if it's been a really warm fall leading into what's a warm winter to begin with, they'll delay uh, putting those on the shelves to sell all the products and maximize their profits. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, we've done a whole suite of these uh, looks, these case studies. Uh, we've got one for reinsurance, uh, one for livestock uh, agriculture, in addition to the corn growing agriculture, uh, air transportation and safety, uh, private sector weather providers, coral reefs, uh, even fisheries, the value of our information to figuring out to figure out where to go fishing, uh, both uh, commercial and uh, tourist fishing. Uh, and I wanted to kind of end on the next slide with one idea here, and that it's really difficult to get the insights and to understand the uses of the information if you're not understanding who your users are. And that relies on communicating with them and engaging with them. At NCEI, we keep track whenever we go and talk to somebody. Uh, last year, uh, we kept track of about 11,000 folks that we talked to. And you can see the breakout. They come from all different parts of the, uh, the economy, from education and public administration, which is government, uh, to scientific services, finance, construction, uh, folks who are all coming for our data. And to gain an understanding of what they're looking for based on who they are starts to tell these stories that, that John and his folks helped put it together for us. Uh, but it also helps us know uh, which of our products are useful, uh, which ones we might need to work on, and maybe there's some things that are a little old. Uh, that aren't needed anymore that we could spend some time doing some new things with. Um, so if you go to the next slide, this is just kind of the, the motherhood and apple pie uh, ending, right? NCEI data, weather and climate data is important uh, for a lot of things. We're on TV weather stations in terms of departures from normal. We make it into phone applications, uh, but more importantly, we make it into safety, security, and convenience. Uh, issues uh, as well. And if you go to the last slide, I leave you with a couple of links. Uh, if you want some more information, uh, you're welcome to check out any of these. And all of these have contact information in them that you can reach me uh, or you can reach somebody from our staff. And we're happy to address any of your questions based on that. And with that, I will end and say thank you. And thank you very much, Mike. Um, are there any clarification questions for Mike before we go on to the next speaker? None from the, the room. Any from the online audience? Nothing? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mike. So now, last but not least, is um, John Firth, who's the Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of the Acclimatize Group Limited. Um, John co-founded Acclimatize with Dr. Richinda Connell in 2004, and they've worked on nearly 400 adaptation and resilience projects in 70 countries for both the public and the private sectors, including in, the, in, in our host country, the UAE. So um, without further ado, I'd like to pass on to, uh, to John. So John, um, it will be the same as with Mike. I'm going to beam up your presentation here. Just tell me when you want us to um, proceed to the next slide. Can you hear us okay, John? Yes, fine, thank you. And uh, my apologies to everybody that I, I wasn't able to make it to, to the event. Um, I mean, it's really interesting to follow on from Stephen and Jed and, and Michael because uh, it just occurred to me, I, I'm the odd one out in this group of experts because uh, my role is 
and what my company does is not we're not a, a data provider we do collect data we analyze data but our role is actually we're at the user end um so i confess i'm a user um so um and with that i i just wanted to really just reflect on some of the challenges I see working with users and, and really just begin to point um, uh, an indicator of just why Earth observation data is just so vital to our understanding of a change in climate and the implications of that and in designing solutions. So uh, can you just go to the next slide, please, Tansy? Okay, so I've only got three or four slides. So, um, and really, I, I just wanted to have a slide that just starts off by trying to explain some of the challenges that users face in trying to understand, you know, what are the impacts, what are the risks, what are the vulnerabilities, actually where the solutions are when we start talking about a change in climate and some of the implications of that. Um, and, and, and so that, that's my sort of starting point. But then to give two examples of where we, we are using Earth observation data to enable robust decision making. And, and by that, I mean decision making that really is about making a difference. And um, one is in terms of project and investment screening, potentially in seconds, and, and that's a cloud-based software that, that we use, that we have and, and sell and secondly something about the risk disclosure process for commercial banks some of you may may have heard of the task force on climate related financial disclosures or tcfd it's something we've been working with uh, unep fi and tcfd recently and i'll give you some uh, examples or, or some indication of the of the challenges and issues that, are, that are, are evident in that. So if you go to the next slide, please, Tansy. So this is this is the challenges slide. Now, I'm not going to explain all this slide. I use this quite a lot in all sorts of ways and forms to, to explain all sorts of things. But it really is a recognition that when we think about climate change, it's not just uh, an we, we, sorry, we, we cannot focus just on the climate science. What we do is take the climate science and then try and understand how that interacts with all sorts of other data and all sorts of other social, economic and environmental systems. And one way of doing that is with this conceptual diagram. There's um, a vertical dotted line um, uh, through the word present. And to the left of that line, historically, we've had a very stationary climate, particularly in the sort of last four or 500 years. And the advantage of that is that it's enabled us to produce all sorts of engineering rules and guidance that enable us to plan design with a great deal of accuracy about how our climate is performing, what the weather will be, and therefore what, how our social, environmental and economic systems will perform. And that's quite important because every system has a fail point, a threshold at which it fails, uh, which is demonstrated by this critical threshold line. Um, and below that line, if you just press the next, the next one, I think it'll show, that's it. There's a, a sort of a red area and that, that's what you might think is the headroom or the margin. So as our climate is relatively stable, there's always an extreme event, a storm or whatever it can be, which will breach that threshold line and cause a failure in a system. But by and large, if we design to have our systems so that they have that headroom in place and we can manage with that critical threshold line, then we understand and uh, can plan. Now, unfortunately, we're in a situation now where that climate curve is actually moving upwards. And the effect of that is that it squeezes that headroom box. If you just press the next button next that's it so our headroom becomes squeezed now in order to understand how 
how vulnerable we're becoming, what our sensitivity and exposure is, there's some vital information we need. A lot of the focus is on trying to understand the climate, but actually we need far more data and far more information about society, economy and environment. Because what we're trying to do when assessing the impacts of climate change and building adaption and thinking about resilience and thinking about what those solutions are going forward, we're trying to solve a very, very complex equation of which climate science is just one function and one element. We need the other data sets to cover these other areas so that we can understand where that threshold is, where it should be in the future, where our headroom should be, and what sort of adaptation should take place. So Earth observation data is far more than just climate data. It actually starts to cover these other data gaps and data needs. So just click again, and then again, I'll just come off this slide and onto the next one. And again, please. So just go back, sorry, just go back, sorry. That's it. So bearing that in mind that, we, that we, we, we're faced with a complex equation and Earth observation potentially has the ability to start to fill in some of those other data gaps. Let's start to look at some of the practical ways in which we can use that data and make decisions that enable us to integrate climate change into decision making. Both these examples I'm going to give now are very much about financial decision making. Um, we developed a, a cloud-based project and investment screening tool called AWARE. Um, and the purpose of that is to enable a user to screen a company or a project for climate risk. It is a screening tool, it's not a full-scale assessment tool, but it enables somebody to start to look at what the potential risks are. Do I actually need to assess them in detail? And particularly in the context of AWARE, are, is there a lending risk associated with this project because of a change in climate? And so what AWARE does is analyzes climate risk for a range of assets. It can do it in seconds. Um, it uses the most up-to-date climate, natural hazard, and socioeconomic data we can find, and it draws heavily on the Earth observation world. Um, what may look like a very simple process when you go into the system is actually accessing literally millions and millions of data points drawn from open access, open source data, including some of the sites that we've heard mentioned earlier. Um, now, what's important about this is that work that could be done normally, what work that pre previously was done a few years ago by taking days and days and days to undertake a screen, and searching for data, which is always the, the, the difficult part, can literally be done, uh, as I say, in a few minutes, producing a report that enables the lender or investor to go back to the project uh, sponsor and start to have detailed discussions about what those impacts are, how can they be mitigated, is this a project I wish to invest in. Um, Aware for projects was, was designed for investors and lenders and um, organizations such as the Asian Development Bank and the European Investment Bank are using this system to screen all their projects and investments for climate risk. And I'm very pleased to announce today that we just signed up a third development bank and that's the Islamic Development Bank who are also going to be using Aware to screen all their projects. Not, not, and it's not the projects that have a climate change element is all their project to understand whether there is a climate change impact in those projects that actually needs to be addressed. Go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I mentioned the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, and we've been involved with a project, the United Nations Environment Programme Finance Initiative. Uh, working with their banking working group and that involves 16 of the largest commercial banks in the world and their logos are shown here. Some of those banks will be active in, in the region, in, in uh, Dubai and the United Arab Emirates. They cover the globe in terms of their scope 
and they cover just about every sector you can possibly imagine in terms of uh, lending and investment. Um, what TCFD called for was that all corporates, including investors themselves and banks, should disclose the risks and opportunities of a changing climate, both from transition to a, a low carbon world, but also from the impacts of the physical, of the physical risks. And they should disclose them in such a way that they were they were consistent with financial reporting and enabled investors and shareholders to make decisions. Um, we were asked to support these 16 banks and we've been working with each of these banks now for nearly 18 months, helping them understand and think about how do they go from a climate change model to what's it mean to my credit risk model? And the gap between those two sorts of models is enormous. And I'll come on to that in a minute. So this is very much about a support process to enable these banks to assess and disclose climate related risks. Um, and it, 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 one of its objectives was a, a more harmonized approach of the banking sector. Uh, we published a report back in June called Navigating New Climates, and, and that's gaining a lot of traction, not just in the banking sector, but in the wider investment sector as well. So just go on to the next slide, please. So this is a very, very simple overview of the, the, the methodology, which is, trust me, is incredibly complex behind it. Um, this is, this is, even when you look at the TCFD recommendations and some of the commentaries on it, it talks about this left-hand blue box, physical risk scenarios taking the outputs from climate change models and using them to assess your risks and opportunity within your own company. Now, the, the point here is that none of the global climate change models or regional models, none of the downscaled models, none of the uh, impact models in which they feed into, for example, agricultural yield impact models, none of those models were ever designed to ask to answer the question, what's the impact on my credit risk model and my probability of default of loan as I sit here in a bank? Because that's the metric they have to be concerned about. And that's the metric for them of climate change, not two degrees C, is probability of default of loan. Now, there is nowhere that anybody has sat down and tried to work out, well, how do I go from the outputs from climate models and impact models all the way across and have the data that I need to perturb somebody's credit risk model. And that really was the task that we had. And so in, in developing this met methodology, which include, for example, things like sector pro productivity, revenue and costs of goods sold, property values, loan to value ratios, a whole host of, uh, of issues, we produced data and analyses that the banks could then use to perturb their credit risk models. But all of that required access to earth observational data and other data sets. And without that access to the open access of that data, we would not be able to do this and nor would the banks. So these methodologies that have been developed can be applied to other sectors. Um, uh, and, and work is ongoing with that, with that at the moment. And again, with these 16 banks, we're talking about further development of, of, of these approaches to this. But the key thing is here, if we can't as a globe and as a global community begin to understand how does a change in climate affect our financial markets and the way business is operated and the way private sector works and the way in which investment decisions are taken, noting that it's the private sector that produces most of the goods and services we require under a changing climate. If we're not able to do that, then the private sector can't respond and react to the challenges ahead. So using Earth observation data is going to be absolutely fundamental and vital to the way in which we respond to a changing climate going forward. 
And I can you know, add, there, was a, there is a parallel piece of work looking at transition risk as well, which effectively is saying, saying the same thing, we need data. So I think, I think that's my last slide, just, just check, Tansi. Yes, that, thank you. And, and just say, if anybody wants to contact me on this, I mean, we're very open about publishing our work. And if you go onto our website, we publish other consultants' work because we feel it's quite important to share knowledge and uh, uh, and information where that's, where that's available. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Um, are there any clarification questions for John? A lot of information for everyone. Is there um, anything from the online audience? Great. So if I could ask my esteemed panelists to come back, there we will open, we'll start having a few discussions now. Excellent, okay. Good. How are you all feeling? How's the energy in the room? Yeah, it's been a long day. You're getting there? <laughs> this is where we'll ask you for no some questions as well. Wait, no one's no, asleep. Yeah, no one's asleep. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, so if I could ask the first question to, um, uh, I think you can all jump in on this one. Um, if you had to convince a decision maker in either a developed or a developing country about the importance of using Earth observation data, to address climate change, what would you say? If you have, you know, it's like the elevator pitch, let's say. You have one minute in a, so Stephen, you first. Yeah? Okay, John, over to you. <laughs> I've just been told to give that, that question to you, John. Sorry, thank, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel as I... Stephen and Jed later for that. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, one of the challenges we face in this world, as I met, I sort of slightly touched on it a few moments ago, is that um, we've had this benefit of a stable climate, which enables us to have all sorts of set guidance and rules on, on engineering, for example. A changing climate rewrites the rules about the way this world works, not just on environmental, but also on economy and society, culture, and inevitably on then in, in and straight into politics as well. Um, and Earth observation data is absolutely essential when it's combined with other data sets as well to start to give us that analysis that we need to understand this very complex world that's starting to appear around us, for which we have no written uh, source, we have no, we have nothing we can go back to, to say in this situation, the answer's X. Um, this is all new stuff and it could be pretty scary out there. So we need not just new data, we need new analyses. I and mean, I think it was quite interesting to hear, you know, the, the example of the next rad, data being produced for one purpose, but, but then begun, begins to be, uh, be apparent it could be used for something else. So we need both new data and we need new analysis. And to me, Earth observation is this, whilst we've heard some amazing examples so far, I still believe it's an enormous untapped resource that if utilized properly, really does give us um, uh, an opportunity to address some of the challenges that a changing climate will pose. So to me, it's very much about you either embrace a new world and look for new data and look for new analyses, or unfortunately, you're going to be a loser. And I, I know that's sad, and in some cases that will be disastrous, but that really is the choice we face. We Decision makers have to change their the way they look at and appraise problems. Stephen, over to you. So I, I spend quite a lot of my time, because we're an intergovernmental organization, I spend a lot of my time talking to ministers, sometimes prime ministers, presidents, and I'd never ever talk about climate change to them. Not, not ever. Probably three things I would talk to them about. One would be 
um, depending on the level of seniority, reporting. So what do they have to report as government officials? How can we help them with the reporting? Believe it or not, that's quite sexy and interesting for them. The second thing would be um, votes. So what, what's going to get votes? What's going to help people who are in power? So that might be something on the socioeconomic side. How would it help? And the third thing is risk. Everybody's interested in managing risk. And actually, the credit risk stuff that John's put up is probably something I might add to my armory. But I would never, I don't think I've ever got into the, the climate change discussion because it's just too hard to frame as climate change. You know, climate change is so open to interpretation by different people. Um, I would think so. I, I don't. I don't know if I've ever talked to a prime minister about this kind of stuff, so I, I can only imagine. But I, I think well, you know one thing that comes to mind is that you know the the Copernicus program, the Landsat program, um, you know the, these these Earth observation pr uh, programs that I work with quite a bit are completely free and open. I mean these are like astonishingly expensive data products. They've been so expensive to produce uh, that have been produced by you know governments. Um, for the benefit of the entire world. And if, if you, know, you are in a country that doesn't have its own Earth-observing satellite and you're not using these free resources, I mean, that's, that seems it, it, criminal. Yeah, I was gonna say foolish, but I thought it might be mean, but criminal is also really mean. But I think that's, that both are accurate. I mean, I was in a, a session yesterday, uh, it was the, the, the big data working group. This is for the, the UN Global Data Platform where we had a bunch of people from national st statistics offices talking about, you know, new alternative approaches to gathering national statistics, right? Like, you know, counting the population, census type stuff. And there, a bunch of people talked about using Earth observations to do this sort of stuff. You can use, like, settlement layers and things like that as proxies for, for population. And a woman from the UN Environment uh, Department, or I don't know what you call it, but, like, she was talking about water modeling that they had done using satellite imagery, and they'd produced really accurate water model data and they had vetted it, they'd done all the peer reviewing, it was extremely rigorous you know, process they'd gone through. And she was basically pleading with the statistics officers from these countries, be like, just believe us that this data is good. You know, we believe it's good, it's been peer reviewed, and we present it as, a, as a, an official statistic produced by the UN, but if your country doesn't accept that as an official statistic, I don't know what to tell you. You, know, you should be taking advantage of this sort of stuff. And I think there's a lot of perhaps parochial uh, you know, not built here type mentality that keeps people from taking advantage of these things, and it's criminal. <laughs> Thank you, Jed. Um, Mike, would you like to add anything, um, given uh, the level of different decision makers in the U.S.? Yeah, sure, um, I, and I would probably address this question just a little bit differently. Having come from the National Weather Service, um, convincing people to use the information isn't usually too difficult. Uh, it's always helpful to remind people that you know weather impacts everything they do. Uh, when you get up in the morning, you got to figure out whether you're going to take an umbrella to work with you, whether you're going to uh, wear a coat. Uh, I don't know uh, how many of you check the weather every morning. It used to be to de decide what the kids needed to wear to go to school and whether they needed a coat. And you know, as they become teenagers, it's to convince them that they need a coat. Uh, and they shouldn't be running around in shorts at 40 degrees or something uh, that teenagers like to do. But, you know, from the data side of the house, um, I, I would largely uh, mention things like, uh, you know, if you're going to address climate change, uh, you can't do it without understanding the climate that you're living in now. Uh, you can't understand or describe that climate without Earth observing data. And you can't have the Earth observing data without having somebody take a measurement, whether that's uh, a satellite or somebody on the ground going out, uh, dedicated weather observer going out in the rain at midnight uh, to empty his rain gauge. Um, but just the understanding that it's prolific to everything that we do uh, and to draw attention to the folks who spend a lot of time uh, both collecting the observations and getting the data ready for use uh, would be my argument for that question, I think. Stephen, you wanted to add something to that? Yeah, yeah. Um, Mike talking made me think about the head of the IPCC, Abdallah Moxit, calls it climate chance, 
not climate change. Because he says there's an opportunity to look at the positive elements and build on. So it's not all negative. If we're doing this stuff, there's an upside to doing it. And we need to look at that instead of just saying, woe betide us, we're all going to fall off the edge of the world at some point. That's for those flat earthers in here. So, you know, there's, you've got to think about the opportunities that come with it as well. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open up to the audience, actually, because you've been very patient and we've run over with some of our presentations as well. Um, I do have other questions as well, if there are questions from the audience, but are there any questions from the audience for our panel? Gentlemen over here, can you share? If you could say your name and organization and question, please. Uh, Jerry Butler from the Bahamas, Hamels Consulting. The, the, in one of the presentations, uh, he indicated that uh, he saved a company, I guess, a further lawsuit of $2 billion. And uh, that's, he was talking about um, what happened when a utility company was affected by storms and it caused fires, et cetera, right? And then uh, one of the panelists spoke about how this data is so valuable. So I guess the, the question from the private sector that I keep asking, and maybe this is a question for John, John Firth from acclimatization, is how do you determine the price uh, for the software or for the data that you uh, are selling? Or is it when he said that uh, the African Development Bank and the other development banks are using his software, they use it for free? I wanted to know what would be the subscription cost if it's not free, and how do you determine the pricing of such valuable data? Wow, excellent question, thank you. Um, John, I think that was directed to you, but using Mike's example, so if um, John, maybe you start, and Mike, if you want to jump in, you can say something as well. Over to you, John. Hello? <laughs> Have we lost? Um, Your question was too hard. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Mike, or have we lost the connection completely? Okay. Okay. Any any of you two? Would you Sorry. want to? You know, I I think the the, the question is is a super important question because it opens up all these r sort of really sort of this complex math, at least in my head, because we we talk about you know the the value of these data sets. Um, you know, I thought that you know the Noah's presentation was was remarkable because you know you, we learned about how much money saved. You know, just the value of this data. Except it's not like nobody nobody made money off of this. People saved tons of money, right? So we know that uh, you know that if there's this massive saving of money, or the example you know that, that Stephen mentioned of the hours required, days required to do something that now takes 15 minutes, right? Because of the cloud. Or I talked about the story of 250 days saved. That that yields a huge increase in productivity, but it, it's very difficult to, to follow, the, to even identify the money to follow it to figure out who made money off of this, right? Because it's not like just cash has been created, it's just, but, but productivity has been increased. And um, it, creates, it creates this impression that the data is valuable, that it can be monetized, and I, I'm not sure that, that that's always true, um, that, that it can be monetized very easily, be, even though it's valuable, if that makes sense. Uh, one model that I know has ha that, that has been used in sort of sustainable architecture and development has been um, you know sort of retrofitting buildings, for example, to be more energy efficient. And one pricing model that that works, and I know is employed in the United States at least, is that somebody will come in, they'll say, look, you know, we will do some sort of retrofitting. We'll put on solar panels. We'll you know fix your heating and air conditioning system, and you will pay us based on the savings, on the cost savings over time. So there'll be some sort of upfront contract and they'll say, look, we're gonna look at your meter uh, for the past 12 months or the past few years and see how much you've been spending on electricity and whatever savings that happen after our intervention, we're gonna get a cut of those savings. So you'll pay less in energy, but you know you can use your budget to pay, to pay us back a little bit. And I think that might be one way to approach this kind of thing. Um, but it takes tricky accounting, right? That's, that's difficult accounting. And in a lot of places, especially you know, government organizations that have uh, you know, complex procurement laws, they have no idea how to, how to enter into contracts like that. But 
I think that's one way to approach these kinds of things, and, and one way to think about it, at least. Any other, any other questions? Mari? Thank you. Um, Mari Luomi from the Emirates Diplomatic Academy here in Abu Dhabi. Um, thanks for the fascinating uh, panel. I think the best uh, presentations are, are, are always the one with maps and m maps and the uh, nice images, so that was very entertaining as well. Um, now. Um, we're, this event is taking place next to the World Data Forum where uh, leaving no one behind seems to be a big theme. It's a big theme on the SDGs and everybody's uh, uh, focused on, on, on that side of the SDGs in addition to, to uh, the environmental side. So it's essentially about ending poverty and what we're talking about here is the environment. So um, I, I think I didn't hear yet today anybody mention or talk a lot about um, how do we bring these tools to those, mm, the poorest, poorest countries in the world, the ones that are in the danger of being left behind, what what can be done to build capacity to to um, help help uh, decision makers in these countries make the right decisions, and also at the data forum today, somebody mentioned reminded once again that GDP per capita is not a good good measure of development. There's countries like the UAE where also building capacity is a huge challenge. So if you could reflect on that, what's the role of capacity and how can we how can we they take the data to to all countries? Thank you, Mary Stephen. So so that's <laughs> that's pretty much what Geo does. I mean that's our role is working with. Uh, we, we've worked with countries mainly around the world, like you heard Mike talk about his work on GDIS, the Global Drought Information System. There's a lot of people in the north who've kind of like gone to the south and tried to educate and share information, and we're changing that now, and the focus is much more on low- and middle-income countries and least developed countries. So, I, I mean, one example is where um, the Africa Regional Data Cube that Jed mentioned is five countries who've been looking to use Earth observations across a number of thematic areas, agriculture, illegal mining, forestation, some other areas. Um, we're now taking that fi those five countries and scaling that up to 50 countries. So we will provide analysis-ready data for the entire continent of Africa. And what and that will that will be I mean this is the example I was giving of going from a month and a half to fifteen minutes, and this is something we're actively funding. Now we're going out and we're bringing money in to make it a fifteen to twenty year program, not uh, not the typical three year project where you go in, do the work, and then leave again, and then it's kind of useless. So that's one example. I mean we we, we exist to do exactly what you described. We have a capacity building um, team that's been around for, for 10 years doing this stuff. But what I did say, and you might have missed it, is I, I said at the end we're, we're much more getting into the co-design and co-production of knowledge. So going in and just doing a training, you know, my knowledge, albeit it may not be that much, but my knowledge has been gained over the last 25 years or 30 years or however long I've been working. So doing the odd training program here and there gives you some skills, but it doesn't give you the long-term knowledge. So that's what we're working on, is trying to do that in those countries, and I guess what we call the global south. So, But this region here is really, really missing from our agenda. Really missing. I mean, and part of that is the challenge around the open data discussion. We've really hit a brick wall there. So um, UNESCO have come to us, the, you know, the Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, and said to us, we want to work collaboratively with you to think about how do we do that? How do we take all these open data resources and open systems and open platforms that Jed was talking about and bring them in and, and tie that to the SDGs? So the example he was talking about, I think was Gillian Campbell from yeah, UN Environment. They've done work with us on the development of SDG indicator 6.6.1. There's an entire methodology there. It's all free and openly available. And it's for anybody who wants to look at the spatial extent of water, no matter which country you're in. So, okay, your local conditions will change, but you have a methodology there to get you started on some of this stuff. And if you think about the number of indicators, I mean, it's a staggering amount of work. I mean, they're not all environmental, but there's a big portion that are. So I don't know if that answered your question. I kind of waffled a little bit. But what I'm trying to say is there's a lot going on. You just have to plug into the network. Super. Thank you very much.
Yeah, and I, I have a few thoughts on this. I mean, one I think one thing I think I should be more explicit about when I talk about this democratization thing, and I, I sort of hint at it with the ornithologists, but like we want a, a greater diversity of people looking at this data, right? If you have, you know, a bunch of American people with master's degrees being the only people who look at the data or PhDs looking at the data, they're going to be looking at it through their own lens, through their own perspective, through their own needs. When you democratize access to data, when you make when you allow people from different perspectives who've never had access to this kind of thing before, they're gonna look at it through a different lens and they're gonna see something different. And that's critical. And, and that's, that's one thing that we hope to accomplish. But on, on the other hand, like, I don't think that like, the answer that we should be seeking necessarily is like, we want the most marginalized people in the world to be looking at satellite imagery. Like, and I know that's not what you're saying, right? But I think the way that you know, the people who don't get left behind or the way that you know, we're, we're able to include more people is gonna, it's gonna happen in ways that It'll, it'll appear almost invisible, or the involvement of Earth observations in it won't be apparent. It'll be, you know, somebody, you know, s some sustenance farmers suddenly having insurance products available to them that they had never been insurable before, because no one could ever validate their claims before. Nobody ever knew, you know, they'd never come to that part of the planet to survey it to figure out, like, does it flood a lot? Are there droughts a lot? Are there fires a lot? Is this the kind of place that we could insure? How would, you know, how would we, how would we do this? Um, there are a lot of places where people have never been able to, to grow beyond sustenance farming because they can't get insurance. And someday, I mean, it's already ha this is actually already happening, and it's, I think it's going to accelerate that suddenly there are all sorts of people who have never been insured who will be insurable. And that's going to completely change the way they approach their business. It's going to completely change the way they make decisions. And it will be because of Earth observation data. And they'll have no idea. You know, They'll have no idea that's what caused it, but that's, that's what will have caused it. Um, just a question to the organizers. Do we have the online audience back or not? Because I think not yet. Okay, so I think we're in a little bubble. I think they're, here, it'll be, they're able to listen to themselves, but they're missing what we're talking about in here. I think Mike and John managed to answer that last question, but we couldn't hear their answers. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, if you could... Yeah. So I, I just want to add a slightly different perspective to your question. Um, one of the things I talked about in my whiz -bang tour was the Geo-Human Planet Initiative, and that's absolutely about not leaving people behind in a different way. So looking at, there's a, a data layer called the Global Human Settlement Layer from the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, and they're working with um, Flowminder, with Season University, at Columbia University Season at Columbia, um, with uh, on so there's Wirral Pop, there's Pop Grid, there's all these things that are trying to look at settlements and ways of measuring population and doing censuses and stuff, which is very much related to the meeting next door, and bringing that information in. And Earth observations are used as a way to measure some of that information as well, so that those people who are not forgotten as well, there's a way for them to be recognised as well. Thank you. I'd like to add, ask a question to you both, actually, because um, we've started talking a bit about challenges, whether it's from a capacity development perspective, whether it's from the, the most needy. Um, so what, what do you both see as the key challenges that need to be overcome? And I'm going to preface this question as well, because if you look at an issue like climate change, we have essentially, according to the last IPCC report, 12 years to make the scale of the change needed to actually safeguard the planet for for our, ourselves as well as our children. So if we were to look at this situation in 12 years time and say, we did it guys, what challenges would you say we, you, you, you've overcome? I, I think, I mean, there's, there's, there's a couple of obvious things and those are like, I, I went, um, I, I'm very lucky I had the possibility to go to Thailand on holiday and I was swimming in the, in the sea in Thailand and I thought someone had grabbed me and I had a panic attack, and it was a plastic bag wrapped around me. And that was like, wow, that was like my own wake-up call about plastic in the ocean. And I just thought, this is bizarre. And then I looked around me, there was tons of plastic in the ocean. So something like that, if we can even just get on top of like, you know, there's a ton of these things, but that one for me would be if we can improve like the way that plastic, how, it, you know, microplastic getting into fish and getting into or ecosystem, something like that, I'd, I'd really like to be able to look back. A, a different way of looking at it is um, I, I have a 14-year-old son, and I asked him, 
I don't know if any of you have heard of uh, Fortnite. Has anybody come across Fortnite? So you've got a teenage something as well, is it? So, so, you know, Minecraft caught the attention of hundreds of millions. There's now something called Fortnite that all the cool kids are playing. And I said to my son, I said, why, why did you start playing this? How did you get this? He said, because it started trending. I said, well, what made it trending? He said, well, because people were playing it. I was like, okay, <laughs> this is where, where's this going? But if there's a way to get other people interested in climate change through something more interesting than us talking about all the negative issues and get the next generation like, you know, doing scenarios, maybe John can create a game based off of aware, but I think there's other ways we have to think about of, of like influencing and getting people to think about it. Yeah, I, I, I love that example. And uh, yeah, you know, my default answer to this sort of thing is business models, right? It's still, I think it's still very unclear like how people pay for these sorts of things, you know, who's gonna pay for the data, what's, what's a sustainable way to ensure that, that people continually have access to, to data. Um, but let's, if we're talking about a 12-year time horizon, let's forget about that. Like, we'll figure out a way to make data available. We've got lots of generous technology companies that are you know, pitching in right now, which is fantastic. Um, I think what Stephen brings up is, is, is the most critical thing, which is that uh, we are very wonky people. We're policy people. We're data people. We make rational decisions based on data. Um, people don't necessarily they're not always convinced by that, and they don't make decisions based on data all the time. They often make decisions based on emotion and by peer pressure. Um, I mean, you know, and, and motivated by things that are fun and interesting to them. Again, I'm gonna, you know, riff on what Steven said about uh, in human interoperability. We, there are a lot of tools that we could use uh, to help change people's behavior, and these are emotional tools. These are human tools. It's not all data-driven. Uh, they're psychological tools. We, we need to be, I think, as a community, much more explicit about the urgency and need to change people's behavior and to have conversations that might be difficult where we, we're going into communities and we're saying, like, we want to persuade you to behave differently because we, there's an urgency to this. And I, I know that kind, even that language of saying, I want to compel somebody to change the way we behave makes people super uncomfortable. And we're running out of time. And if, if, we're, if we can't get comfortable about, about that and figuring out how to change people's behavior, we're, we're gonna run out of time. It's a hard conversation. Great, we've got Mike and John back. Um, Mike, John, we're talking about the challenges, the biggest challenges from a um, uh, data perspective that need to be overcome to address the climate challenge. Um, Mike, would you like to go first? Uh, sure, I can do that. Um, coming from the government side, uh, at least, you know, from the NOAA perspective, uh, you know, I appreciate what Jed said and, and I agree with it, but from the government side, we don't really get to do that when we come and say, Hey, you need to change your behavior. It, uh, it's not necessarily taken very well. Um, so that, that's something certainly from our standpoint that, that we don't deal much with, uh, from our standpoint, there, there's a certain, uh, amount of, authority that we get inside the data center by being uh, removed from some of that. Um, if any of you are familiar with uh, 1960s US TV, there was a police show on with a character named Joe Friday. Uh, and when he would interview a witness or something, he would always stop them and say, just the facts, ma'am, right? Uh, that, that's kind of who we are. We're the just the facts. Uh, kind of people. We don't necessarily m move into that, uh, into the other space, uh, but we do recognize the, uh, the challenges. Uh, and from our standpoint here at the, the information center, and from what we can do, you know, the free and open da data access is one of the most important things uh, that we have control over. Um, and that enables folks like Jed and Amazon to take advantage of that, to build other tools. It, it enables John yep. to, to build some of his things. It enables the private sector to build theirs uh, to carry into that space. Um, and that's probably where I would leave that. Thank you, Mike. John, anything to say on this? Um. I think a very, I'll just give you an example of a very practical thing, and, and I'll talk a bit, then I'll just mention something more general. Um, 
you know, one of the really interesting things is working with these 16 banks. I mean, these are the biggest commercial banks in the world. Um, was they didn't have the IT capability, and I'm not meaning that in a critical way, it's just reflection. They didn't have the IT capability to look at climate change. And what do I mean by that? Is they work entirely on spreadsheets and really, if you want to try and understand the change in climate, you have to start having a spatial dimension to your analysis and you need GIS. And only one of the 16 banks had any form of GIS capability in a bank. Yeah, and these are organizations with 50, 60,000 people. So straight away, there's a, a capability issue around tooling up to have the analytical capacity to actually analyze the world around us. I think that's a, a fundamental thing. But I, when I, I just think about developing countries and uh, middle income countries, and you know, we've worked on 25 national adaptation plans, we've worked on NDCs, we're working on climate finance, we've worked all over the world. And uh, you know, I have a real, we have a real problem in our team of being appointed to do some work, knowing that the worst thing in the world is to produce a report that just sits on a shelf. And the challenge is that country you're working with doesn't have the capacity, capability or expertise to carry out this work for itself. And I really I really hope, and I think GEO is doing some great work in this space, along with the WMO and lots of the organizations I know in the, in the room are doing this work in this space, is enabling countries to have their own capacity and capability and expertise. That's the fundamentally crucial step we need in order that we can use the data, in order we can do the analytics, in order that we can find the solutions. Thank you very much, John. That was very clear. Um, any, f uh, we have room time for one final question. Simon. Thank you. Um, my name is Simon Wilson. I work for a consulting firm called Five Oceans Environmental Services based in Muscat in, in Oman. Um, the question I have is that we, we're hearing quite a bit about artificial intelligence through other channels. What um, value do you think artificial intelligence could bring to Earth observations to increase the information content or the uh, sort of targeting of that information to the decision makers. How, how do you think AI might influence this whole ecosystem of data? Just before I give Jed the responsibility to give the coherent answer, I spent three days last week with 90 people talking about artificial intelligence and Earth observations. So I can't answer you succinctly, so I'm going to give it to him. So uh, it's funny. I mean, you know, machine learning has become, it's like, a, it's part of buzzword bingo. Everybody's talking about machine learning these days. It's, it's not a buzzword. Like, it's incredibly real and critical. Um, so the, 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 the magnitude of data that we're working with, um, you know, yes, you can have humans look at it and look at visualizations and GIS and things like that. Uh, that'll get you so far. Uh, what the, the beauty of machine learning and in this domain is that it, it gives us such an, a huge assist, right? So, uh, for instance, detecting change and things like that. When we have all these sensors and all these systems that are observing the planet at, at various resolutions, using various tools, looking at various wavelengths of light that we can't even see, um, you know, we have all these models that can, that can turn all that data into some kind of information, but detecting patterns among it, detecting change within it, um, at the scale that we need, humans just can't do, right? I mean, we, we can, it'd just be really expensive um, and take a long time. So machine learning gives us that sort of leg up where it's an assist where we can, we can write models that will say like, there's something going on here. And of course, a human with an expertise who understands what's going on will have to be there to interpret it. There's a great comic. I'm gonna paraphrase a comic, which is a really bad idea, but here I go. It's just sort of like, the, the situation is like, how did the, it, it's surprising that all of the robots that, you know, came from the uprising used ancient technology to fight their war and they were so easy to defeat. And the punchline is like, well, if you look at the training data, most wars were fought using, you know, 
cannons and old technology. And so the, that's how machines will look at it. They'll be like, well, it turns out most wars are fought with this ancient technology, therefore we should use this ancient technology. That's, that's the peril, right, is that people think that, well, you know, machine learning is this big thing now, and soon machine learning will solve our problem. That's not true. Machine learning is not coming to save us, but it is coming to assist us quite a bit. Um, the challenge is, is that, uh, like, there's, most research that's being done in machine learning isn't being used for ecological purposes right now, right? And that's where we're really trying to accelerate. We've been supporting a project called SpaceNet for a few years with uh, Digital Globe, which is awesome. They opened up some really high resolution imagery that normally m mere mortals don't get access to, but they did it explicitly to help people write models that can, in, you know, uh, computer vision models that can detect things in overhead imagery. And that, that work is accelerating. It's been very successful. So, so my boss is the former director general of the space agency in Brazil, and he was responsible for the deforestation work, the open data in Brazil 12, 14 years ago. And he talks about the ecology problem and artificial intelligence. So my boss codes in R and Python, which is like, well, anyway, I, can't, I shouldn't say too much about my boss. But he, he talks about this because the issue, the ecology problem is if you look at, the SDGs and everything else, they talk about forest. What is a forest? Forest is defined in so many different ways, but all it says is forest. And so, and he's been trying to write these algorithms for artificial intelligence to, 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 to run these, these machine learning things, and he's come up against this ecology problem. And so that's what he does. When he does his presentations, he talks about exactly that. So that we're so far away from solving some of these issues because there's some fundamental things we have to come over first. Um, Mike or John, uh, any of you want to comment on this question? Um, I mean, I, I think a bit like Jed, I mean, I see artificial intelligence as an incredibly potentially valuable and useful process that we can take advantage of. Um, I don't understand it. <laughs> But I know it, ha it clearly has enormous benefits. I do think, you know, you, Jed just mentioned about patterns. And, and that ties into something we're thinking a lot of and doing some research work and actually talking to Amazon a little bit about. And we talked to Mike's team as well at NCI. Um, you know, climate change isn't something that starts today and is something off in the future. Climate change started 40, 50 years ago, and we're already on the curve. And we ought to spend a little bit of time looking backwards to try and understand, and this is where Earth observation data comes in, because of the enormous history of data that it's got, try and understand actually just what are some of the signals and patterns we potentially can find if we look for them in the way social, environmental, economic systems are changing, such that it gives us an indication of what might be happening in the near term as well as the longer term. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is where artificial intelligence comes to play. Yeah, Thank you. <clears throat> and, and if I could jump in, at, I'll just mention that at, at least from the government data center perspective, you know, we've been looking a little bit uh, into some of this neural networks and things like that uh, to help with some of our analyses. But somebody uh, made a comment a couple of weeks ago at a meeting I was at that it's not the government's role to be today in IT. That's really the private sector's role. Uh, it, it's kind of our job to be yesterday. Um, and that's good enough because it allows uh, private sector to enable uh, growth uh, and go after these kind of uh, activities. So honestly, it, it's something we're kind of playing with. I don't know that it's gonna have a huge impact on the way we do what we do uh, at a data center yet, uh, but we're hoping that somebody can figure that out and shortcut some of the things uh, that we're doing. And I will put this plea in there. Uh, when these fundamental pieces of understanding do get teased out of the data, um, make sure they're available. Uh, I mean, I know there's probably some proprietary business advantage you can take uh, of it for a while, but you know, eventually landing in a, a peer reviewed publication or something like that, 
uh, where you can document and make sure that the scientific understanding is there of what you're doing. Uh, that's really big for we who are trying to provide that base level of data services and being able to move into that world uh, to have that understanding documented. Thank you. And as you were speaking, Mike, we ironically, we got a sign on the right with a big red sad face saying time is up. Um, <laughs> so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to uh, try to summarize the breadth of all the, the discussions we've had today. Um, I think if I was to reflect on one thing, I'd say Earth observation data and its use in action on climate change, it can't just be seen on its own in terms of the type of data that exists already. It's about how do we actually talk in the language of decision makers that would convince someone to actually change the, the status quo. Because the status quo has been that we are actually on course for a three or four degrees warming. And that's assuming everyone has the best intentions to actually implement the pledges they made at the Paris Agreement. Otherwise, it's even beyond those, those temperature increases. So it's about making building bridges with different communities. So we're in this kind of room now and, and talking to our kind of, uh, in our little uh, setup. But there are other communities out there. There's the financial community, like um, John mentioned, who think about credit risk and whether their loans will be paid back. How do we make sure that climate risk information is actually transformed into data and language that they understand to change their decisions? Um, there's political um, language as well, which some people work in those circles will need to transform this in, in a way that convinces decision makers who might seem quite anti, anti these sorts of decisions to actually change. So we have to try and find ways to build bridges with different communities. And then there's the basic uh, and very critical area around investment in capacity building, especially in um, to actually help um, empower people in, in countries who don't have necessarily the investments and the infrastructure or the historical scientific investment to actually take charge of their own fate and and, and look at the problems themselves in, in in the way that they know best in their own national settings so um the scale of the challenge is large but i'm uh, we have um i hope you know if this kind of thing happens again in 12 years we do sit back and think yes we made it because we overcame some of these challenges so Stephen, maybe your son will be the one who creates the game that will get the younger generation to actually take climate change seriously and it will trend. And, um, and that's the hope basically we have uh, to rely on as well as what we can all do today and, and after we leave this event. So thank you everybody for your attendance, for your efforts. It's 7.30 in the evening here or beyond. Um, so again, great dedication to you all and thank you very much. All the best, bye.